Good morning and welcome to our online church today. This talk is called Sustainer in a Crisis. Recently at a senior leadership committee at Clare House, where I help as the chair of trustees, I've heard many of the wonderful people that work there talk about how they are now running on empty. And there's a palpable feeling of digging in deep to keep on going. As I hear their experiences in this third lockdown, I know for a fact that it's the same in hospitals and GP surgeries around us and that people are exhausted some clinicians are feeling defeated and demoralised and have been really ill themselves, sometimes twice, with COVID. You can see that running on empty in the face of Matt Hancock. And I can see it sometimes around our brave dining room table at home. We see tears falling for no obvious reason. And the brave comments and determined focus on our blessings really show how much we are actually struggling and feeling our losses. Our grief tanks are kind of overwhelmed at the moment by over 100,000 deaths, probably closer to 120 COVID deaths if we take the ONS statistics. With more than a half of these in the UK in the last three months, we should have known how to prevent this, having all but eliminated the virus in August. Hannah Mumford stated in her lovely sermon online two weeks ago. She said, I brought my own anxiety and feeling of being overwhelmed and empty by the latest lockdown before God. I said to God, what is it that you have for me in this season? What words do you have for me? And straight away she received this answer. You will know me as your sustainer. I will sustain you. What a lovely thing to hear from God when you pray. And checking that definition of sustainer expands our thinking to include the way that God will uphold us, will be our backer, our champion, will keep us from falling, will supply our needs and nourishment. The God who gives us existence will carry on giving us sustenance and care and love. God will supply our needs, support us and encourage us and will uphold us spiritually. And we could end that thought right there. But if you want to carry on, let's talk about Elijah. Yesterday I listened while I was doing another less interesting job to the whole wonderful oratorio by Mendelssohn of Elijah. Incredible lyrics and the most beautiful music, just bringing the Bible to life like, on, like something on the wind. The exciting life of Elijah started when he lived in the mountains of Gilead, east of Jordan. He lived away from any city of renown. He didn't have any high position in life. Elijah the Tishbite. But nevertheless, he entered upon his mission, confident in God's purpose to prepare the way before him and to give him abundant success and adequate resources. He had seen Israel going deeper and deeper into false beliefs and worship of false ideas and idolatrous gods. God had, God had done great things for the Israelites, but they seemed so easily to forget the evidences of God's working and even more easily to accept a whole lot of crazy new practices and ways of thinking, new to them and maybe exciting, but truly old and evil inspired practices. Elijah's heart was literally breaking by watching the demolition of the Holy Kingdom of the safe, once favoured people. And he prayed to God to arrest their wicked course, to visit judgments on them if necessary, 
that they may be led to see in its, the true light what how far they were from heaven. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness to rebuke sin and to press back the tide of evil. One of their alternative facts and alternative beliefs was that the dew and the rain came from the ruling forces of nature through the creative energy of the sun, a little bit of truth, under the control and blessing of Baal and not of Jehovah. Elijah's tank of peace and confidence in his community was nearly empty. He was literally grieving over the sake of the state of his nation, God's nation actually. The Israelites were ruled by a king who had become wicked and deluded and had no limit to his activities of wickedness. Elijah didn't seek to be God's messenger, but God sent him the very clear, with the very clear task of dealing with the situation. He was called to his task and set out at once, traveling day and night to get to Samaria. And when he got to the gates of the palace of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, he didn't make a humble request for entry. He just went in. Wearing the coarse clothes of the prophets of the time, he went straight through the, guard, the guards without attracting attention and suddenly appeared in front of the astonished King Ahab. Bravely, he spoke to King Ahab. First Kings 17, 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. It seemed impossible that the beautiful green verdant forests and pastures and flowing streams could change, but immediately and for three long years afterwards there was a famine which the prophets of Baal were unable to overrule. They still insisted that Baal would sort it out, but the wicked Queen Jezebel was desperate to kill Elijah and to get rid of him for what he'd done. And so she started to kill the other priests instead. Obadiah, another faithful priest, actually hid a hundred priests, 50 in each cave, and gave them food and water. People died. The, the effect was terrible. Chronicles 2, sorry, Second Chronicles 7, 13 to 14 says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And Ezekiel 18, 23, 31 and 32 says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will ye die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Back to the palace. As soon as, I, as Elijah had delivered his message to the king, the word of the Lord came to him, leave here, turn eastward and hide in Kerith Ravine or Cherith Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did that. He did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. That reminds us of Isaiah thirty three sixteen as well, doesn't it? Such a man will dwell on the heights. His, defen his place of defence will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him. Water for him will be sure. First Kings 17, 7 goes on. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him again. 
Go at once to Sarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, oh, and bring me please a piece of bread. What would you do in that situation? Her reply, as surely as the Lord your God lives. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jug and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and then die. They must have already been quite hungry if she thought that after the last meal they would die. We must have been quite undernourished. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. The jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. That is sustaining. That is a miracle. It wasn't an accident that Elijah went to someone who had nothing. It's not an accident that God comes to us when we have nothing, when our tanks are empty and our hearts are drying out, when our energy is failing and we're hungry for something so much better. In our weakness, he can show his strength. 2 Corinthians 2.19, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When emptied of yourself, then it is the time that God can fill you with his goodness and love and peace. Now, have you had different jars and tanks in your life that have already been miraculously filled in the past. Let's not forget them. I can think of some things that when I look back are kind of miraculous because I don't know where the energy came from, the boundless energy needed to be a junior doctor working the hours that we worked. 85 hours a week, 120 hours every third weekend, that, that for that week when we had to do the weekends. As a single-handed consultant doing the job that now has five people in the previous job. Without that energy, which was a miraculous filling of a tank, I would say, I could never have coped or have had the willingness to care for all the people that I had to deal with. Coupled with that, I can think of an overflowing tank of love for people that was not of my making or my power, but was a miraculous refilling miracle from God. It was God's love, not mine. I can think of a time at Abadaran when we were going to do the communion. A lot of you know this story. There was a big camp. I think it was 120 people and the communion bread didn't get made by an oversight. We came to set up the table for the evening communion with no bread. And Andrew remembered we had water biscuits in the car and he went and I think we were trying to work out we might have had four or five. And after praying over that bread, there was enough for everyone to take part 
in that communion service. Countless fellowship lunches, in my experience, have not had enough food, but have been prayed for and have gone around. We should notice when we get our tanks filled up and think of the different ones that we, we do have. Now, the widow was not an Israelite. Prophets and Kings, page 129. She had not had any of the privileges and blessings that the chosen people of God had enjoyed, but she was a believer in the true God anyway and had walked in all the light that was shining on her pathway. She had always treated all strangers with kindness and liberality. Now, regardless of the suffering that might result to herself and her child, she trusted in the God of Israel to provide. What a reassuring situation. Someone who lived in Israel must have helped her or shown her something about the true God that made her want to, want to follow. And she was able to see the true goodness of the God of Israel, despite all the badness flowing across the country. Her faith was strong and pure, despite idolatrous, crazy teachings all around. And it shows us that God's children are all around us. We don't actually know who they are unless God shows us. It also shows that the highest tests of our faith and the highest services to God can be right in our homes and in our communities, sharing what we have with others. This lovely widow took in a Jewish refugee. And this week, while we remembered the Holocaust Memorial Day yesterday, the theme of that was the theme of light in the darkness. And it links to every type of badness and wicked evil that we might have to stand up to. I'm going to spend a couple of moments on this. They divide their, their theme for yesterday into four. Darkness drawing in, light during the darkness, how to deal with the darkness of today and being a light in the darkness. The darkness of distortion and hate and emotional darkness happens before every genocide or before every horrible situation, distortions are deployed using propaganda and stereotyping to identify and victimize a specific group or groups into being discriminated against. The light in the darkness can include resistance, rescue, lighting the way with kindness, shining light into the darkness. And that people are, that are being badly discriminated against, kindness is massively powerful. Shining light through testimony, confronting denial, distortion and misinformation, our responsibility to be the light. Do you know that there are 79.5 million forcibly displaced people in the world, or at least they were in 2019? But the startling fact is that 85% of refugees are cared for in poorer developing countries. By contrast, in the UK, at the end of 2018, there were only 126,000 refugees, 45,000 pending asylum cases and 125 stateless people in the UK. That's a quarter of 1% of the UK's population. Generosity and hospitality, kindness and respect for others, whoever they are, is part of being a child of God. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 41, he who receives you receives me and he who receives me sends, receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Anyone who gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, will not lose his reward. Hebrews 13, 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, 
for in so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. What about these jars again? These tanks that are empty. Elijah's and the widow's jar only filled up enough for a day. What sort of jars do we have that need God's daily filling up with his never ending miracle? Jars of courage and strength, certainty in our hope and our faith and our resilience. A jar of friendship, of not being forsaken, but filled with friendliness. A jar of the ability to heal and rise up that may be only enough for a day at a time until the drought and famine in the land is lifted when our tanks can be completely refilled. But that daily sustaining presence of God will be there. Enough just for the day. Enough to get you through each step and through each trial. Enough peace to drive our fear and anxiety. Enough love to help you to forgive. Enough patience to keep you calm just one day at a time. One of the highlights recently was watching the presidential inauguration in America after the turmoil and tumult of the previous years and especially of the previous weeks. Amanda Gorman made the most amazing poem that she'd just written. And it is in a book that's just been published. It's called When Day Comes. And I'm going to just close reading a few highlights from that again, because I think it ties all of our experience recently together with this story of Elijah and the widow. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learnt that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a community, country, committed to all cultures, colours, characters and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew. Even as we hurt, we hoped. Even as we tired, we tried. And that will be forever, be tied together, victorious. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it. And only if we're brave enough to be it. My prayer for you is that as you let the Lord into your life and heart, that you walk in the light of truth as the widow did. And as you take others truly to your heart, that your jar of flour will never be empty and that your jar of oil will not run out until the day the Lord will make rain in the land. Thanks be to God. May he bless you.